Few forces have shaped the modern world as much as Christianity. And in the history of Christianity, few writers or thinkers have had such far-reaching significance as Paul. In light of this, it's not surprising that Paul's letters have received a lot of attention in scholarship. Particularly, scholars have asked, what defines the core of Paul's theology? That's the question that Richard Hayes set out to answer with his 1983 book, The Faith of Jesus Christ. The problem with Paul is that it's not easy to find one central idea tying his writing together. That leads some people to say that Paul was an unsystematic or eclectic thinker. Others say that religious experience governs Paul's thought. Since the Reformation, a common solution has been to say that Paul's governing principle is justification by faith, the notion that having faith in Jesus put you on good terms with God. One problem with this is that the word translated faith, pistis, can also mean faithfulness. With that in mind, Hayes considers the phrase pistus Jesu Christu. Traditionally, that's translated as faith in Jesus Christ. But Hayes argues that it actually means the faithfulness of Christ. Paul isn't talking about trust. If Hayes is correct, then faith can't be the defining idea in Paul's thought. Instead, Hayes suggests that Paul's theology is grounded in a narrative substructure. He quotes, The framework of Paul's thought is constituted neither by a system of doctrines, nor by his personal religious experience, but by a sacred story, a narrative structure. This all rests on the premise that a story may control a discourse. And Hayes justifies that premise with recourse to scholars from three different fields. The first of these is Fry, a literary critic, who suggests that meaning may emerge from a narrative, and it only makes sense with reference back to that narrative. Secondly, Recur, a philosopher, says that narrative requires configurational elements or organising principles to make sense of sequence and events. These configurational elements can be discussed without their narrative form. Finally, the biblical scholar Funk specifies between foundational and reflective discourse. Foundational discourse, like a story, shapes a worldview. Reflective discourse repackages that meaning without just retelling the story. In short, a story can structure a text, even if it's not a narrative text. Hayes is suggesting that we work backwards from the text to reconstruct the narrative substructure. In order to do that, Hayes needs a way to analyse narrative structure, and he does that by drawing on A.J. Grimas' work. Grimas suggests that the syntax of a narrative can be visually represented by the actantial model. Here's how it works. The sender in the top left commissions the subject to deliver the object to the receiver. Their success or failure is affected by competing forces, the helper and the opponent. Consider Shakespeare's Hamlet. The ghost charges Hamlet to bring justice and order to Denmark. Claudius opposes him, and various characteristics or plot devices help him on his way. So what happens when you apply that same model to Galatians, where Paul is outlining the essence of his message? In chapter 3, Hayes identifies the following narrative. God sends Christ to bring freedom, blessing, and spirit to all people. This is facilitated by pistis and opposed by law. And in chapter 4, God sends his son to bring freedom, adoption, and spirit to all people. The opponent here is law and the elemental spiritual forces. The narrative substructure is almost identical in these two texts, and it appears once more slightly modified in chapter 3. God sent Jesus Christ to fulfill his promise to believers. Law and sin oppose this, while pistis facilitates it. Hayes concludes that this narrative of Christ is the core of Paul's theology. Altogether, Hayes' argument has considerable strength. His discussion of faith is detailed, his case is clear, and he's the first to properly consider the significance of narrative in Paul. On the other hand, his insistence that Paul is unique with regard to narrative is unwarranted. The premise that narrative may shape thought should be given a wider application than Hayes allows. He also doesn't consider the significance of other narratives shaping Paul's thought. Though he uses the actantial model, he doesn't justify its validity. Finally, this work had a significant impact on the field of New Testament studies. It reignited the Pistis Christu debate and forced scholars to reconsider their assumptions. The narrative approach he formulated has been adopted by other scholars and several significant works and major scholars still draw on Hayes' approach. All in all, this was a very significant piece of scholarship, forcing clearer articulation of views and introducing the idea of the narrative substructure to Pauline scholarship.